We're delighted to have uh, Jane Ferguson here with us. I just want to say um, thanks to our co-sponsors, the International Institute and um, the Department of Asian Languages and Culture. Uh, we're going to have a talk uh, on November. Uh, Jonathan, can you remind me? Um, in, in about two weeks with uh, Ismail Alaka, who's going to be with us, so we hope that you can come here for that. Um, I just want to quickly introduce Jane. It's a real pleasure to have her here. She's um, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Australian National University, uh, but resident in the States for this year, so we took advantage of that. She got her up here from Ohio. Um, and uh, I kind of think of her as being one of the handful of people who really get the most out of Southeast Asian studies, the most fun, uh, a little, I, I was thinking, how would I describe her? And at, at the end of all the Burma Studies conferences, she is the MC. She is the person with the guitar. She is the person singing in Shan, then in Thai, then in Burmese. Sometimes I first her sing in Chinese, but you don't have that as one of your languages on your TV. Um, but there are a bunch of others, as I think Spanish and Vietnamese are in there too. Um, but yeah, I thought maybe I would describe you as being sort of like the Alfred McCoy of your generation without without the kind of macho side. To it. <laughs> yeah. But you know, there's that kind of Hunter Thompson um, aspect. Let me to, to sort of put A to that. Let me um, give you just a couple of the titles. So uh, her her book, her first book is. Um, Repossessing Shanghai, Myanmar, Thailand, and the Nation State of Birth that came out last year um, with Madison University of Wisconsin Press. Um, and then later this year or the beginning of 23? I think. Yeah, beginning of 23 is the next book, uh, Silver Screens and Golden Dreams, A Social History of Burmese Cinema, which is coming out with Hawaii. And then last night we were just talking about the next book after that, which is, you know, maybe a year or two later, she was, she was saying her, her technique is to procrastinate by working on one book so that she can avoid working on the other book. Um, it seems to be working pretty well. Um, but that one is going to be about air flight and airports in Southeast Asia. A lot of us are really looking forward to that. But let me just read you a couple of other article titles to give you a sense of this unbelievably uh, broad swath of topics that Jane worked on. Hijacking area studies, ethnographic approaches to Southeast Asian airlines, um, air mail, M-A-L-E, exploring flight attendant masculinities in North America and Thailand, discreet to excrete in the concrete, concrete jungle, women vice messengers and their inventive urban strategies in three U.S. cities. City. Um, a bunch of articles from a few years ago that all of us read uh, who worked in Lima, who is counting ethnicity belonging and national census in Burma and Lima, um, the scramble for the wasteland, tracking colonial legacies, counterinsurgency, and international investment through the land, land laws. Um, I could keep going, but I'm, we want to hear her and, and not me, so um, let me. Uh, invite you to help us welcome her for her talk, Four of the Thirteen Lives Were Stateless, and Hollywood Jumpstart Citizenship Reform in China. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the, for the force of uh, introduction. I really appreciate the kind words. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, this particular uh, is uh, a topical in the sense that there's been a lot of um, movies and TV series about this particular incident. And so I'm going to be focusing in uh, on one in particular, the Ron Howard movie, 13 Lives. Uh, we can ask more about what the other um, films and uh, Netflix specials are doing. Um, but also because of my work on the Shan and statelessness in Upland, Southeast Asia, there's uh, some of my ethnographic experience and backgrounds and those kinds of topics. But then also the upcoming book about uh, Burmese cinema, a lot of this presentation will have to do with what are movies doing, what's the intention of movies and how stories are put together. 
And then finally, you know, how do we understand what beliefs are doing, but also what they can and what they could do. So you'll see a kind of a combination of these going on. So this last July, acclaimed Hollywood director Ron Howard released a new film, 13 Lives. The high-budget movie dramatizes the massive 2018 rescue of the wild boars, the boys' soccer team that was trapped deep within the Nanon Cave near Nessai in Chiang Rai province, Thailand, far north. The movie is wonderfully enthralling. I don't have stuff in it, but I encourage you to watch it anyway. It focuses on the event, largely as experienced through the travails of the international di divers, played by Hollywood A-listers Viggo Mortensen and Colin Farrell. Though it does include aspects of the coordinated efforts, dialogue with the boys, their families, local authorities, Thai Navy SEALs, and villagers. The cave dive, the set, the characters are all brilliantly executed. The narrative arc is full of suspense, tears, sacrifice, and a beautiful happy ending. It really does pull at the heartstrings. Spoiler alert, all of the boys are rescued. Um, so I want to show the trip. In 2018, I was in Chiang Mai, northern Thailand, when the story happened, the story of the trapped boys, when it hit national news. I anxiously bit my fingernails as I followed the rescue on TV. At the height of the cave boys media frenzy, from Sean contact, I learned that three of the kids, as well as the 25-year-old coach, were not Thai citizens. They or their parents were born in Shan State, Myanmar, or in the case of the coach, was second generation born in Thailand, but his citizenship had not been conferred because of the complex and costly labyrinth of Thai bureaucracy. So four of the trapped lives were stateless. For the rest of the world, it seems, the story of the cave rescue presents a spectacular, heartwarming triumph. People from all over the world came together to help these trapped boys. But in addition to the almost universal sympathy that the story attracts, what happens when we examine the movie itself and its story for what they might expose about regional geopolitics? The ongoing war and economic crisis in Myanmar and Shan State continues to push migrants and refugees across the 
border and into the lowest echelons of the Thai economy. This reality, coupled with the Thai government's reticence to reform its exclusionary citizenship laws, created this widespread predicament of statelessness. How much of this contextual story will a Hollywood movie portray? So as a commercial movie, fundamentally, 13 Lives has the dual role of being both a capitalist product as well as a sophisticated form of storytelling. 13 Lives is based on recent historical events. How certain elements of those events become part of the plot to a two-hour movie is an elaborate process, and those involved have varying degrees of agency in steering its outcome, from writers to actors to directors to set designers to editors to sound engineers to stage coaches to producers to casting directors. Let's not go on. You can watch the credits on Amazon Prime. But staying true to the story, as it were, is a matter of interpretation. As is gearing that story in all its elaboration to intended audiences. What does it mean to get the story right? And that's italicized in my brain. Who decides and then what? We can consider this dilemma as a matter of optics, thinking of event framing, narrating history, and how the many disparate stories involving thousands of people are implanted and narrativized as a single discrete movie? Can the problems alluded to even obliquely be actioned into other sorts of discourse or even political and social change? So for today, today's talk, um, in addition to having read the uh, abstract that I'm sure you all have, uh, I will explore Ron Howard's movie, 13 Lives, specifically in relation to questions of culture and the political situation for stateless people in Thailand. I will present these as two contrasting stances for filmmaking's engagement with context. The first stance is one of respect and is oriented towards the cultural context, seeking accuracy and precision in representation. I call it a stance of radical authenticity. The second stance looks toward ideals and the possibilities for social change and is one of critique of the political economy and as such, a stance of radical solidarity. Each of these stances objectifies the boys, though they diverge in how they conceptualize culture. This does make a difference in how we think about the movie and what it is doing. So part one, getting it right, radical authenticity. So for starters, at its most basic level, is any motion picture's illusion that what happens on the screen is live. In the celluloid days, we see 24 frames per second, not as splitting still images, but as movement. Then, sound on film production provided audio tracks over a speaker system to give the impression that it is those characters on the screen that are doing the talking. Kind of rad that this is also on Zoom for those of you at home. Not really me. Uh, in this sense, the spectacle, the effort for radical authenticity is principally a technical challenge. Building sets and animating characters to take audiences to this make-believe world, viscerally and affectively. This is the interface at which consumers are gripped by the presentation, suspend disbelief, and feel as though the events are unfolding in front of them or that they're part of them. This suspension leads to a transcendent experience in consumption. It becomes an easier leap of the imagination to emphasize with the characters. And you can think of which movies have given you such a visceral experience, even though you really know it's illusory. For 13 Lives of Technic, to make the scene, they built a replica cave set in Queensland, Australia, and armies of consultants including cave rescue participants themselves, share their ex expertise to reconstruct the details, the mechanics of the rescue. Contextual particulars included Honda Wave motorbike, grilled pork on fish, you know, come here, we'll sing, sticky rice and grilled pork, um, the specific type of temporary aluminum frame awning used at open air markets in Thailand all creating scenes for the story. In an interview with 
Vanity Fair, director Ron Howard praised his team's concerns for de detailed reconstruction for the set, saying, the Thai actors, when they arrived, couldn't believe it. They said, we had no idea you foreigners would actually get it so right. So, and, you know, there's the other technical challenge that you want to build it so it appears authentic on the screen, but also build it so that it can accommodate things like booms and cranes and all of the equipment for making the film. So that's another aspect of the technical challenge for producing that illusion. Yeah, so. For populating those sets, according to an interview, director Ron Howard insisted on authentic casting and said the film had to respect and reflect Thai culture. They hired Thai cinematographer Song Kyu Mukhikong and producers Raymond Patata Virampun and Warakon Rutai Wanitakun. Um, if any surname longer than five syllables is usually like sign on side to, to make a huge generalization there, uh, that give away. Anyway, the point is that ties were involved in management and decision making, not just as part of the setting. But, Mesai is a cultural crossroad, a border town, an entry district for many refugees and migrants from Myanmar. In addition to that, we know thousands of people came together from all over the world as part of the cave rescue. Irish actor Colin Farrell, who played cave diver John Volanton, prepared for his performance by video chatting and consulting with Volanton himself. This was useful not only to learn about his experience and ask detailed questions about the event, but also to become acquainted with the man's uh, personality, mannerism, voice, and kind of personal, personal quirk to, to, to play him on screen. In press interviews about the production, Farrell also mentioned personal struggles making the movie, especially in doing the diving scene and his own experiences of claustrophobia and panic attacks, even on the set of the cave. As one of the central protagonists in 13 Lives, Volanthin not only had a great deal of screen time, but he was an in individual familiar to many international audiences through the news. But some individual characters end up being scrutinized more than others. And this depends on prior knowledge about them, who they are, and what they represent. So we can also consider how different forms of cultural intimacy beget cultural gatekeeping. So acting out the characters, the particular, and the composite. In 2015, after observing that no people of color were nominated for an Oscar that year, April Rain posted a cathartic hashtag, hashtag Oscars so white, which served to galvanize the movement to pressure Hollywood to be more inclusive and diverse. A 2020 New York Times article noted that U.S. film and TV studios had started to employ different kinds of dialect coaches to depict people of color thoughtfully and authentically. Knowing that they would be representing people from Mexi, South for 13 Lives recruited numerous actors fluent in Northern Thai to play the speaking part. Film editor John Wilcox acknowledged the challenge that this linguistic diversity presented for his own work. As he said in an interview, how am I going to get this translation right? How am I going to get the cultural aspects of this language right? How am I going to get the dialect correct? Not only are these boys from Thailand, but they're from northern Thailand, and some of them are near the Myanmar border. That dialogue is very different from that of the people who reside in Bangkok. So his intention to be sensitive to the context of Thailand far north, rather than the heartland, is a point well taken, even if he is glossing over its cultural complexity. One key character in the movie is Wu Hong, a composite character representing a stateless child's mom. She was not an actual figure in the event, partly because film producers did not have access to study the boy's families due to narrative licensing rights. This isn't the case for the Netflix series, but still, who has, you know, capitalist ownership over certain dimensions of the story factor into what ends up in each of these um, films? Something we can talk about in Q&A. But, and also, 
high government privacy restrictions. So there was a lot of government involvement in how the story was going to be spun as well. But unlike Colin Farrell, actress Takura Kwan Tung Tupakun could not have direct access to the people she was supposed to play. However, Patra Kwan was praised by the filmmakers for her cultural authenticity and fluency in Gamula Northern Thai. So I have a So to some ears, her, her style of speech comes off as urban northern Thai, certainly not Shan inflected Chiang Rai northern Thai. It's very city girl. Um, first generation Shan migrants tend to prioritize learning central Thai before Gamung, central Thai being the hegemonic national language and often the default lingua franca in northern provinces, despite Gamung being linguistic, linguistically closer to Shan especially Thai Khun of Eastern Shan State. Central Thai is the language which is essential for interacting with agents of the Thai state. However, again, unlike Colin Farrell studying John Belanson to play him in the movie, Pashra Khoi didn't have a specific persona to perform. Returning to the other issue of cultural intimacy, however, if we seek and we gatekeep a local accent as a measure of authenticity, we also deny the cosmopolitanness, the very multiplicality of that place, or any place for that matter. And Messai has long been an important crossroads in upland Southeast Asia. If people rightly accuse Hollywood of whitewashing people of color <coughs> from the extreme, would consulting Thai filmmakers result in Thai washing away Shan narratives? Or would this be even worse? if Ron Howard hadn't engaged Thai filmmakers at all. Taking a brief intermission from 13 Live, I thought it would be useful to bring into the conversation two other Hollywood movies in which Thai government advisors and spin doctors sought to affect how Thainess has historically been presented on the global silver screen. So, this is from um, the movie version with Mar Marlon Brando uh, of The Ugly American. Uh, former Thai Prime Minister Kukrit Pramod played a brilliant Prime Minister of a fictional place called Sarkhan in the 1963 film version of JFK's favorite book, The Ugly American. So, oh, and for those of you who read Thai, uh, it's total gibberish to think, but it's not, those aren't actual words. Sarkhan is a fictional place, but it was filmed in Thailand, but they wanted to make sure that audiences wouldn't think it really was Thailand, so let's just have some uh, jumbled up um, non-language uh, for the uh, Thai caption. Anyway, back to Kukrit. He played the part, despite the film being riddled with fake Thai. Kukrit's Thai was majestic. The Thai speech of Hollywood actors, including Japanese and Indian Americans, was at the other end of speech superlative. It was filmed in Thailand, so the extras, the so-called Sarkhanese, were local Thais, but they wanted to make sure it retained a veneer of fictitiousness to stay out of trouble. 
The 1999 remake of The King and I, called Anna and the King of Siam, starring Jodie Foster and Chow Yun Fat, ostensibly thought to be more culturally sensitive than the former 1956 musical, famously starring Yul Brenner. In a press release, Fox stated, It is a primary goal of the studio and filmmakers to ensure the cultural and historical accuracy requested by the local government. Nevertheless, the Thai government would not allow production on Thai soil. Instead, they filmed in Malaysia, and later the movie was banned in Thailand under the 1930 law, which prohibits negative portrayals of the monarchy. Another point regarding representation in Jodie Foster and Tao Yun Fat, Anna and the King, is that many of the Thai speaking first were taken by Chinese Malaysians and other Asian actors who had but a few weeks to phonetically learn their lines. So again, the accents sound off, as it were. But leaving aside the problematic Orientalist framing of Anna and the King, regardless of your political stance about the monarchy, if you were a Thai actor, would you audition for a role in the film that your government would likely ban, potentially harming your own future participation in the industry, and again, for that <laughs> movie? And would your authentic accent make it a better movie anyway? There is a point where one's own principles or career trajectory affects this stance of cultural authenticity, and one has limited agency to avoid involvement in the narrative in the first place. So actually, I have two minds about this kind of thing, so it will be an interesting point to, to discuss. So for some of this, calling out actors' inauthentic speech patterns without considerate without consideration of political context and broader goals, serves little purpose other than to reaffirm a certain species of meta-snobbery akin to denigrating the self-appointed experts who write those restaurant reviews on Yelp. I'm not saying it's intrinsically bad for an actor to take on an accent. It's an important skill. So this is not a gripe about Mel Gibson's American accent. He's problematic for many other reasons. But seeing the forest for the trees is the broader political context, the ongoing war in Burma, the Thai failure to acknowledge Shan border crossers as refugees. These seem more important than those fractal ethno-national ethno -national traps of precise accent. However, the reality on the ground is often encrypted in one way or another by the hierarchy of access. So the problems of statelessness are compounded by linguistic differences, especially for those who do not speak the fluent central Thai with the privileged accent, let alone northern Thai. Accents are an important part of ethno-national gatekeeping in Thailand, and according to one study, among 51 stateless people, mostly Aka or Lahu, they feel that those who speak Thai, Central Thai fluently, experience less stigma than those who do not, and some rehearse Thai accents in anticipation of going to government offices. My own ethnography among Shan migrants echoes these findings as well. However, if all characters are portrayed with an accurate melange of interplaying languages and accents present, present in Nephi, that might pick an authentic box to some years, but what about the problem of legal statelessness? It seems myopic to go deeply local without looking around. Classic sociologist C. Wright Mills might call this abstracted empiricism. As mentioned earlier, the accent is something that is privileged, scrutinized, and shamed in Thailand. No place is immune from this, really. The fact of the matter is that the Thai military government and Hollywood alike get a convenient pass while millions of stateless people struggle to survive in Thailand. The fame of a labyrinthine cave rescue is not going to change that unless these political points are acted upon by a broader social movement, unless you think the Thai government is going to change its policies to sound of benevolence. So part two, to getting it right, radical solidarity. Shifting from the set design and the actor's presentation of the people and their accents, the idea of radical authenticity, to the political questions that the story could raise, um, to consider a broader structural critique of Thailand's citizenship laws, or 
What about the fact that this story took place in the context of a military dictatorship? So the everyday struggles of stateless people in Thailand pervade the country. At the individual level, people are not only unable to avail themselves of services of the state, such as health care or schools, but even where there is provision for stateless people, they are often reticent to do so because of their precarious legal status or fear of prohibited costs. In the country, from registration data, there are nearly half a million stateless people, but the actual number is likely in millions. They are, second, they are the second largest stateless population in Southeast Asia, with Myanmar having the largest. Today, the, esti the estimated ethnic Chan migrant population in Thailand is about a million people. This is further confounding as Thailand will not recognize Chan migrants as potential refugees for the UNHCR to facilitate resettlement. Thailand is not signatory to the 1951 Convention on Refugees, nor the 1954 Convention relating to the status of stateless persons. As a result, statelessness is not defined in Thai law. It was the 1956 civil registration which sought to document citizens, but those in the periphery were overlooked out of convenience, bigotry, economic interest, or a combination of the three. Another related explanation for the lack of systematic policy is Thailand's frequent regime changes. Whoever in power will just leave it for the next regime to deal with, rather than serve what many see as a controversial hornet's nest. Oh, supposed to be pretty. One of the people I watched this movie with said that he's more handsome than the actual pretty. I'm not sure if I agree with that. Okay. So just a couple of months before the 2018 cave rescue in Thailand, in Paris, a short video of the heroics of Mamadou Gassamo, a 22-year-old migrant from Mali, went viral on social media. The, the athletic young man made a death-defying climb up to a fifth-floor apartment balcony to save the life of a toddler who was hanging precariously from the balcony. A real-life Spider-Man, President, President Emmanuel Macron met Gassama and in a press conference announced, in recognition of his historic act, he would have papers in order as quickly as possible. However, when activists pushed Macron regarding French citizenship laws and the everyday difficulties faced by migrants and refugees, the president responded, an exceptional act does not make a policy. Macron could have been referring to any political regime. Recalling Giorgio Agamben's theory regarding the ability to make exceptions is what defines the sovereign, after all. When one attracts exceptional attention for heroics and potentially reveals a fissure in the state apparatus, the state swoops in and regards, rewards the hero rather than fixing its fissures. But had the amazing Spider-Man's act not been captured on a smartphone, or had Gassama dropped the child five stories onto the concrete below, would his bid for French citizenship simultaneously have fallen flat? Had the boys not been rescued and then invited to media appearances all over the world, the issue of their statelessness would have been dead in the water. The Thai government made an exception and granted the four stateless footballers Thai citizenship in haste so they could travel to Los Angeles. Well, here's one of the um, presentations for, for Coach 8 receiving special citizenship cards. And then also so they could travel to Los Angeles to appear on the Ellen Show, among other international media appearances. As we see, everyday oppressive laws are only made embarrassing to the nation when a non-citizen becomes famous for doing something unilaterally heroic or good. Everyday statelessness is one of the Thai government's various dirty secrets, fueled by the desperation of workers and refugees fleeing conflict in neighboring Myanmar. Hollywood, in the case of Ron Howard's movie, touches on this issue very briefly. And you remember the, the clip from Bohol actually mentioning, you know, my, my kid is stateless, are you going to help him? But it handles it with kid's love. Without signposting or belaboring these political points, the re region 
personality ends up being lost in the cast of the Hollywood story and various nods to the local suffering anti-heroism. I found this interview clip of, of actor Colin Farrell quite telling about this um, situation for the movie and see what he finds most important about it. Yeah. So for some concluding thought, you know, it's too nice that he's not into the star system and that shit, just like being a Hollywood aide this kind of thing. Anyway. Um, I return to my question at the beginning. Can Hollywood jump start citizenship reform in Thailand? Am I barking up the wrong tree when I ask about the statement? Is Colin Farrell doing his job to promote the movie? Still, more questions need to be asked, and these are being done by everyday activists in Thailand and advocates for, for stateless people's rights. For an industry like Hollywood, something like cultural authenticity in Maasai is more akin to a technical problem than a political one. Of course, politics are involved at every step, but they can always suggest a, tech, a technical solution rather than an existential crisis. In approaches to culture, the differences between stances of radical authenticity and radical solidarity, for movie making, the former treats culture as a technical issue. You can go to it to learn, respect, and reflect upon as you incorporate it as part of the narrative. Similarly, in aviation management and engineering, which, which looks at what it calls human factors, is an adaptation of the technical interface to local cultural nuance and ways of seeing. The mechanical apparatus, however, largely remains in and serves the interests of the powerful. Turning to ideas about culture from a stance of radical solidarity, this not only questions the reasons for how and why a group's culture has largely been excluded, it also lets them collaborate to build their own apparatus to tell their story as they see fit. In the stance of radical solidarity, culture incorporates what is not reducible to technical factors or the things that can be studied to be replicated precisely and accurately, but looks towards social transformation in ways that imagine how society could be different. In other words, radical authenticity sees culture for what it is and responds to it as such, but radical solidarity includes the broader context to listen and imagine to what it could be as well. So Ron Howard went to considerable lengths to present, or Ron Howard and his very well-paid and expensive team went to considerable lengths to present contextual accuracy, radical authenticity, in the making of the movie. In an earlier interview about the movie, 
regarding why he chose to make the story into a narrative fiction story rather than a documentary, he noted that dramatization is intrinsically better at capturing the suspense, the feelings of the characters in the moment, than a documentary after the fact. As Burmese author Adon Yuni Hyun pointed out, since the early days, people go to the movies in order to get the feelings transmitted by them. Part of what makes dramatic stories so powerful for audience members is their capacity for aesthetic identification, as I mentioned earlier, not only being absorbed in the story itself, but filling the gaps in the narrative with the feelings or details of one's own life. Feeling afraid in the cave, anguishing, not knowing whether your child is safe, delighting in a SpongeBob birthday cake, or maybe not that one. Suspending pessimism, or what has been called in studies about race, lived deconstructionism, reflecting on the actual story, we can see that the hegemony of Cayute is not absolute. There was care, empathy, and volunteerism at the local level and within bureaucracy to effect unprecedented rescue. There is a possibility for humans to come together to do amazing things. It's a wonderful and enthralling story, a magnificent story that really happened. So author James Baldwin once referred to pop culture as the sunlit playpen in which so many Americans lose first their identity and then their minds. Intrinsically, then it merits our attention if we want to analyze contemporary society. As a rejoinder, though, Baldwin himself noted that mass culture is not just a mere reflection of our chaos, that that very chaos contains life and therefore tremendous energy for change. Thank you. I look forward to your questions and discussions. So we've got the microphone. And we'll round and round and we'll take questions from the conference. So I have a, you, you were focusing on um, representation and authenticity and solidarity, right? Mm -hmm. Cinematically. And I'm wondering what have, um, if we look at it in terms of choices and constraints in cinematic storytelling, because mm -hmm. I'm thinking of this comparative stuff, because I actually did watch, I watched the Netflix stuff this week, actually. Oh, okay. So you you watched all six of them? I watched all, I watched the documentary and the series, but all out. So it's interesting, right? The fact that, like, the issue of statelessness just popped up briefly and then exchanged, and then it, I forgot, it shows up like out of the blue here. Yeah. But it has no, given the choice of storytelling, and partly it's, they're focusing on the rest. The issue yeah. of statelessness doesn't have an obviously hook in structuring the pragmatics of direction, the, of, of the rescue which they focus on, yeah. right? The decision, what to do, how to do it, who's going to do it, all that, right? So, it doesn't seem to have such a strong hook, and it, you know, in in the immediacy, right, of the rescue, and that's a huge part of the movie, right, in terms of timeline and the story. Yeah. Whereas in the Netflix series, it only focuses on the rescue in the last hour, right, and so there's five other hours, and the statelessness comes up in the series several times, and it actually opens the framing up, right, you know. So, but it doesn't talk about the series doesn't talk about statelessness after the rescue, right? right? So the storytelling ends with the, the dramatic success of the rescue. Mm -hmm. And and in this and in the movie, that the, the rescue itself is such a big part of it that it seems to just squeeze it out the opportunity. Yeah. But it's interesting in both cases, it seems to me, if you really want the statelessness to be to have fertile ground in which you could jumpstart reform. You actually need to tell the story like the prior, which the series tries to do, but also the story of what happened after they were arrested, right? Mm -hmm. And then the issue of the question of statelessness would become more obvious, I think. Yeah. And and so I'm just wondering, like, you know, there are there are directorial and industry constraints, right? About yeah. storytelling in different venues and whatnot. And yeah. I'm wondering to what degree, you know, just that's the question of drama, storytelling, narrative, and structuring all of this as much as certain kinds of representation. Yeah, thanks for that. Actually, yeah, I, 
completely agree with basically everything that you said about this and that there are certain differences in thinking about, okay, you've got the arc of the story, you've got these boys who wandered into the cave, how are you going to get the boys out? And then you have, in general, I mean, because, you know, at the beginning I was talking about, it's, it's a Hollywood movie, it's a capitalist product, and so because of that, they want to retain the audience, and it's generally conservative because, you know, okay, we, we intrinsically know that it's probably a bad idea to catch dinosaur eggs and bring them to life, but, you know, Hollywood seems to have made millions and millions of dollars four times over again with the same basic plot structure. So there often is continuity in the arc of the story to make one of these mass blockbusters. So the constraints of the industry as established, you know, have certain limitations for what's going to be a massive Hollywood, Hollywood hit. And belaboring statelessness when people want to see a cave rescue, um, you could see that as kind of anathema to, to try to put together the arc of the story. The other point, too, I mean, okay, do we want to, how much do we want to change the film and the apparatus to belabor the point? Or, you know, can we think about working on a social movement that, you know, hits the state where it hurts rather than just making the film? Or can the film be an apparatus that brings that attention and helps to start those conversations? I, I think I've seen the Ron Howard one 16 times now with different friends, um, you know, it, both in in Thailand and in the U.S. and you know just watching it with folks to see if, you know to make sure that rather than you know the anthropological approach is not just taking my reading of the film as the reading but how others see it and some people didn't you know just oh they still thought they were Thai kids or that the statelessness even for some people in the Thai audience was you know it, it just it slips by, you know, unless you're watching the credits. And unless you watch the credits and then ask that question, what's going on there, you know, you, that can totally pass you by. You know, we can, you know, if I was watching a cave rescue in Kyrgyzstan, I probably wouldn't know about the particularities of regional accent. So there's, there's that issue as well. Again, that, that point I was making about cultural intimacy as well. A quick comment. I, I'm about, I also think genre matters here, right? Yeah. Like, I think Thai audiences, if you want to deal with this, with statements and all this stuff, they would expect it to arise, arise cinematically in the form of a documentary, right? Rather than a kind of dramatic introduction. There's plenty of independent and other kinds of things about social issues, right? There's mm. things that things that are for a movement and perform. I don't think they think about popular mass dramas of the genre for the viewing that as they did for other kinds of cinematic things. So the ones for, that were filmed in Thailand, and there's the other point too, that they want to present the villagers as like loyal and happy subjects, grateful subjects to the Thai state, and it's the internationally produced ones that are more critical of Thai bureaucracy. So, you know, juxtaposing how these different groups put together, you know, the, the documentary and what kind of things they lay there is an interesting exercise of just taking the arc of one story to save rescue of the boys, but then what it means for these different kinds of storytellers. But yeah, thanks for that. Hi, Dave. Hi, everybody. I'm Amanda. Um, well, I know. We love the points that you're making. I think they um, have the same question, you know, about when, in fact, that picture was circulated of um, the uh, Myanmar and well, multiple pictures were circulated about the government changing granting citizen granting citizenship, right, to to the formerly stateless boys and the coach and their dress, the coach being dressed as a monk, the boys being dressed in their educational out like their school yeah. outfits, right? But that there was those t shirts with Ellen. Yeah, totally staged moment to wrap up um that that the that the and and the position of the Dianker in granting an ID card in relationship to the people who are smaller, I mean, all of that is part of uh, arguably it I think you know extends this, right, as a part of a of the state story as well. Mm -hmm. My question is I was trying to follow up on this too, um, with 
with ACA um, and a couple of Karen activists on the team check in Thailand about how who is at, who is who is on set talking to the directors about statements because my read and I never found that out from Chris who did and and, and his wife I survey is even the UN circulated those images mm -hmm. and said this is wonderful and when I wrote a bank on post Offense, being like, this is a sign that things are massively wrong. Mm -hmm. And I you know, we got all this blowback where yeah. people were like, this complicates the story. There was, I wonder whether that story was even allowed to be told. Like, the state itself has, has a, and because of the context, like the authoritarian context in which that film is being made, the yeah. state has a vested interest in making sure that that is the punchline. And then they were given citizenship. We don't want to ask. Yeah, where are their brothers? Where are their teachers? Where is the family? The millions um, of other people that are stateless. Yeah. And precisely. Yeah. And that you don't have to survive any case if you need to be a citizenship. That's not a prerequisite. For you can rescue a toddler. You family. can rescue a toddler. Right. All of, but there's also a history to that, too, with respect to the mom who was girl who was stateless, who names the panda to do, and if she was supposed to travel, or the, or the um, Sean voice of the paper airplane, right? Yeah. These, these kind of mini crises come up, but it's always been resolvable mm -hmm. by granting citizenship yeah. and using the narrative to restore and reaffirm the kind of power of the local officials, yeah. even kings. I think it's like the critique is wonderful and the questions are huge. And I'm sort of curious whether that story is even possible to be told given the stage that they were trying to, to put it on. And the last question that is the kind of question I'm curious if you know that, but the other thing is sort of in different communities watching how the Akkad lobby and Karen people engaged in citizenship advocacy are reading this. So many of them actually um, now feel that the stakes are so high that this kind of radical solidarity even between them and Sean people, like there's some of them are actually claiming, you know, we're the real state of people and they're not. So like there's some it seems to me deterioration of the possibilities of radical solidarity between stateless people because you know, they're dancing often with the state. Some of them even were protesting um, Jim Scott's talk in 2008 saying, we're not stateless, <laughs> stop calling us stateless, mm -hmm. um, because they are so devastated about having continually been you know, in that position. So anyway, I think the context is of making a film important, but also you're speaking to something that I think is, yeah, extremely um, provocative. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Um, I, I, it, it is true, and it's partly because the Thai state issues so many different kinds of ID cards, and, you know, when I was in field work among Chan migrants, there'd be some who had successfully a, a applied for Hill Tribe ID, or one family that I visited, an extended family, even in that single extended family unit, there were people who had four different types of non-state IDs. So partly it's just the fractal of citizenship and the, the issue that I talked about earlier about the government system of, you know, the, the you know, patching, patching the holes on the leaky ship rather than, you know, with a different kind of new kind of citizenship ID and leaving it to the next regime. So that, that part of the, ongoing issue. Just a, and about the movie, uh, a, a trivia point for those who are uh, fans of Shan State. The guy who plays the provincial governor in the movie also played uh, Mei Win in Twilight Over Burma, the story of English Sargent. So, um, yeah. But thanks for that observation. I totally, I mean, I, I agree with your point that there has to be you know, it's not talking about systematic or structural change, but if there's a movement that can help raise mass awareness and people can talk about it and they can interrogate the movie and be like, oh, did you know that these four of those kids are stateless? Then, oh, you know, okay, why should we care? Well, there's, there's a social movement mm -hmm. about that. So I think, you know, there's a role for it. If, I, if I'm going to be optimistic, yeah. if I'm not going to be optimistic, I'm saying it. No, I don't seem optimistic. Okay. <laughs>
we were to push forward with our structural um, citizenship, as they like to highlight in the line, case and um, You know, when you're talking about catching the holes on a, on a leaky ship, when you have two leaky ships that are going to each other and sailing along the side, the way that it would catch this is a kind of game they're getting their game of citizenship. And so, could we have the same kind of catch on the windward side? And thinking also the over the past decades, there have been periodic amnesties granted some categories of people all along the time in the top order on the tide side. But there's been no equivalent amnesties on the top side. And so it's just, yeah, what would you say if you were to this case a lot of time on the windward side and how the two citizenship work? Well, interestingly, after this happened, I was visiting some friends in, in Myanmar, not about the movie, but about the 2018 cave rescue. And one of my Myanmar friends had said, oh, if those boys had been trapped in a cave in Myanmar, they all would have died because the Myanmar government wouldn't have let in the foreign cave divers to go and rescue them. So uh, maybe not uh, for that particular one. Um, for uh, the, the, the the metaphor of the, of the cars is these kind of dispatches or these exceptions that are made Sure, it happens all the time in Myanmar, and the rich can buy all sorts of patches. Um, so there's, there's exceptions made all the time. Um, and yeah, I mean, this, this is about you know, state power and uh, sovereignty, and you know, Macron granting um, you know, citizenship to, or papers to that, to that guy, the, uh, the real life Spider Man from Mali, that, that's you know, another example of that. <laughs> In that particular regard, uh, they're not so they're not so different. But also the um, I guess the one major difference in Myanmar I even has more stateless people than than Thailand does. Um, they have different paradigms for understandings of the relationship between ethnicity and citizenship. But the technical documents, the state can still make those exceptions. So we're unfortunately out of time. Um, so we're going to have fun. Yeah. So uh, please continue talking among yourself and with Jay and Joy and Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And also, you know, if you have any question or observation, please uh, send me an email. Just look up my email and my directory at CAU. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.